Hello YouTubers and uh, welcome to this next tutorial getting started video about STM32 and STM32 Cube ID. If you remember the last video we introduced timers and we created a timer uh, here, timer 4, that divided the internal clock down the internal clock which was 100 megahertz uh, we divided that down so that an interrupt would be generated after f every 500 milliseconds, half a second. In our software, we would start that timer. The, uh, sorry, here. We would start the timer and then in the interrupt handler, uh, interrupt callback, we would toggle the LI LED and that would make it blink every 500 milliseconds. However, uh, we still had to execute some code. We still had to handle that callback. And as a matter of fact, this could have been handled by the timer itself. And that is what we are going to look at today. Uh, so let's uh, start a new project. Uh, right, let me uh, just open that up again. Well, let's start a new project and see how we could handle this without having to execute any code at all. So we start a new. Uh, this time, I'm going to use a slightly different board. In the previous examples, I used my I used the Black Pill STM32 F411. In this case, I'll use uh, my own uh, STM32 World board, which is using an STM32 F405 running at a slightly different clock frequency. So uh, let's create this. We call it uh, STM32 World uh, Timer 2, since this is our second timer project. Uh, finish. And it is starting up STM32 Cube MX. And there we go. So uh, this process has got slightly more pins and is running a slightly different uh, clock frequency. If we look at our STM32 world uh, documentation, there is a documentation page. Um, bum, bum, bum down here for the particular board that we are actually using. And you can see here it's running a 16 megahertz crystal rather than the 25 megahertz crystal uh, used in the previous example. So uh, let's um, set the debug to well, serial or we're not going to use the trace I think. Let's enable the crystal. Uh, let's set the crystal this one is 16 megahertz, not 25. And we can run this one at 168 megahertz. While we're in here in the clock uh, configuration, it is worth noticing that the APB bosses are clocked slightly different in this case. If you remember for the F411 on the black pill board, both the timer clocks on APB1 and APB2 were running at 100 megahertz. In this case, the APB1 is running at 84 megahertz, slightly slower, while whereas the APB2 is running uh, much faster than it is on the. That it it really doesn't matter, but you have to know what is running at. So. Um, there you go. Uh, let's do the configuration like we are always. Um, let's configure our UART. Uh, yeah, asynchronous, I like to run, as I explained in earlier, 921600. That's pretty much as fast as I can do without uh, any issues at all. Um, and that should give us the basic setup that we want to run. So let's uh, build this project, generate the code. 
there are of course more we need to do but let's get the debug configuration up and running i copy i always end up copying this from another application so we have our redirect the printf we need a we need to load the std io library and um, we need we basically we can print our we can also start our timer but that won't work yet um, so after the initialization we do it here so um, we call that and Actually, to make it clear that it's a new one, I like to make some empty lines. And uh, starting, we call this uh, STM32 World Timer 2. And, uh, well, let's see if that is working. As usual, it will come up and ask because it's the first time we're running it. That's fine. There we go. And let's look at the cell output. Let's run it again. There. So now the application is starting. Uh, let's do our usual uh, tick stuff. Uh, so basically, uh, we have this. Uh, I had a better example, I think, but anyway, we do uh, now. Let's see, uh, now equals zero, next tick equals 500, and uh, loop count equals zero we can set our now just set directly to the uv tick variable we increase our loop count and in the while we say if now is bigger than next tick uh, or equal i think there. Then we set next tick. Now, now plus uh, 500. And we want to print tick. And we can set loop equals. And we need a new line. And we want our now divided by 1000 and our loop count. And we need to reset count equals zero. This should give us our normal tick. Oh, something is wrong. Cancel, well, that needs to go up there. That looks better. Oh, let's see if that actually works. It does. And uh, I, I don't know, I can't remember if I mentioned this, but if you go into properties and see C++ build and change the optimization to debug, it actually execute quite a lot faster. Let's try that. So it's about 10 million uh, loops every second. Yep. That, well, what happens here? It execute two. Uh, da, da. It's not. Yeah, well.
well, me being stupid here, it should of course be a thousand. I was thinking about the So there we go. So now it executes one every one second and it print out and it executes about twenty one million loops uh without actually doing anything. Uh but that is a good start. So let's look at how we make this timer flash our LED. Now the way you do this is by something called timer channels. If we look at the timer four we used last time, we can use that we can clock it on the internal clock. If last time we generated an interrupt every second, this time we won't do that, but we will enable one of the timer channels. And you can see here in the timer channel, we can actually use this to generate PWM, which is pulse feed modulation on channel one. Now, it is worth noticing that the timer is running up here on PB6, but and PB PC. 13 where the LED is actually connected cannot run as a timer channel. So the way we can get around this on our board is if we leave PC13 uninitialized and then run a wire from PB6 over to PC13 where the LED is attached, then everything will run as normal. So how do we get from our clock frequency 84 million megahertz 84 megahertz and down to um to to 500 milliseconds well we will have to fire up a calculator and i have one here and just playing around with the numbers if we take 84 million Remember, we have a 16-bit value, so up to about 65,000. But if we try to divide this by 60,000, we come up with 1,400. So that would be a reasonable way of dividing this timer down. So if we set the prescaler to 60,000, that means 5,900. 59,999, remember these are one off the real value, and then the counter period was 1400, so 1399, that should give us exactly 500 milliseconds. Now notice down here when you configure a, a PVM generation, it is actually a series of pulses, and the complete length of the waveform is what we just configured but the pulse will have some kind of width and that should be a roughly half of it so we set it to 400 uh, 1400 1400 we can set this one to 700 that should mean that it should run approximately 50 percent of the time so let's try to generate the code for this and in the code we will need to start the timer remember last time we started it like that we don't want an interrupt but we want to run how tim uh, pvm start which is there it needs a timer which is our timer four and it needs a timer channel and if we look down at the timer in it says in it down there you'll see that it actually configures the timer channel one so we can use that by copy paste there that means the timer has started and it is starting in cha in pwm plus pulse width modulation on channel one so let's try to run this uh, build project. Let's see if it builds. Now notice we have absolutely no code handling the pulses. So let's try to run this and just verify that it starts. And it did. And what I have done is I have hooked up 
af Troy Oscilloscope uh, to this channel and you will see a perfect pulse there. It can't trigger on it because it's too slow, but it shows a perfect on off uh, running at exactly one hertz. Now, you will also see that I have actually added a wire and the board LED is there, so it flashes exactly like it did last time. So last time we configured this with an interrupt and then we manually switched this LED uh, in that interrupt. Now it is running entirely in hardware and the only thing we actually do in our loop is to print out that loop statement. If we put all this in a comment, it is doing absolutely nothing in the main loop except running. But if we try to run that, you can see that the LED is still flashing perfectly okay. There we go. So it is possible for the timer to flash this LED with the one exception that the port used, the, the pin used by most development boards, which is PC13, cannot be used as a timer channel. Uh, it simply doesn't have. Most of the other pins can actually do this. If we look at PA0, you can see PA0 could actually be used in timer 2, channel 1. PA4, PA3 could use timer, timer 2, channel 4. You can see some of the others. PC, uh, what is that? PC7 could be timer 3, channel 2. So depending on what pin we use, we have to use a specific timer. Uh, in this case, PB6 can be controlled by channel 1 in our timer. Also notice the waveform that you have. Uh, I mentioned the pulse width. If we try to set this to, say, a 1000. And let's generate the code. You will see that the frequency is exactly the same, 1 hertz. Uh, but the pulse will look slightly different. And it should be coming now, there. You see that the pulse is actually much, much wider than it was before because we set it at a higher value. Uh, but the frequency is the same. So in other, that's why this is called pulse width, width modulation. You model, moderate the width. This is not actually, it's a series of pulses and you can moderate the width of those pulses. But the width and space relationship will always be the same so that the frequency is constant. Where are we at uh, time-wise? I think that is enough for today. Uh, next time we will be start to looking at how to modulate an LED, uh, regulate the intensity by running a much, much faster pulse width modulation than we did this time. So there, I hope you learned a little bit more about uh, timers and um, until the next video, enjoy yourself.